So hello, everyone. My name is Maisha Essex, and I am the Associate Director for YWCA Lincoln. Thank you all for logging on this morning. Um, I know it's a little early, <laughs> but thank you for our investing uh, one-on-one class. This class is a part of our economic developments here in our program, Employee 402. The program itself is to help individuals who are seeking mobility, stability, or ingenuity surrounding um, workforce development. And what that really means is it's for support for people who either want to get a job, are trying to move up within their job, or who have create creativity um, around their employment and they're starting their own business. And so this particular class falls under financial literacy because we think it's extremely important, no matter if you're trying to get a job, move within a job or start your own business, that you understand investing and how to invest your dollar. Um, we may not know where our next dollar comes from. So it's really important that we know how to use the dollar that we know we have today. And so I think you all uh, will learn a lot from this. It is a um, investing 101. So it's the fundamentals of investing that we're going to teach you today. We have some other sessions coming up for those who are interested in entrepreneurship and have uh, small businesses. That's in May. Today, we are fortunate to have Caitlin Moore come back and teach this class for us. She is the financial literacy manager for Union Bank and Trust. And so I will turn it over to her. Again, I thank you all for logging on. She'll be able to give you some of those housekeeping rules for um, this session. Um, please, it's a small session with a small group of people because we want you all to be engaged uh, with this and ask as many questions as you need to ask in order to understand some of the concepts that we're teaching uh, or to better understand how you yourself can invest. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Um, We'll just start with the housekeeping rules. I just ask that you just stay on mute. Um, and I've got the controls here. So if I, some people, you know, accidentally unmute themselves, feel free to unmute to engage, but just the background noise, we just like to keep it on mute. Um, I love when people have their video cameras on, you don't have to, but I love it. But just so you know, we are recording this. I will put it on a YouTube um, video and that way you all can have the link. So if you don't want your face on the YouTube video, then you might want to turn your cameras off, but just know that um, you might be in there. So feel free to engage. Um, I do pause for questions, but if you do just have a pressing question, feel free to do that. Um, I, I won't have the chat box up, but if Maisha or Barbara, if you, if you do see that, feel free to interrupt with any um, questions that may come through the chat box. So feel free to use those too. So Today, we're going to do Investing 101, and what this is, is just really the basics of investing, um, kind of speaking the language, because when you get into the investing market, it's a whole different language. Um, it feels like if you don't know what it is, there's a lot of acronyms, things like that, then we have to figure that out. So I'm a big fan of teaching the language first. And then we're going to talk about how to invest. What are, what's the basics of investing? How do I get into this? Even if you only have $10 to do so, what would this look like to invest in the long run? Can everybody hear me? Are we having trouble hearing? We're good. Okay, great. I got a new mic. So I, I still figuring that out. So, okay. So we're going to start here and we'll just um, start rolling through this. I do have some videos at the end because UBT has a new, and literally we just rolled it out this past week, a really basic new investing opportunity um, where you can invest on your own and you really don't have to know very much. So we're going to go through what that is because it's, it's a really great way to start investing with um, just a little bit of money. You don't have to have a lot of money to do it. Okay. So what is investing? When we say investing, we're going to start with our language. So investing is spending money with the expectation of making a profit with the result. So we're going to use some of our money to, we're going to spend it in the, the market. We're going to put it into the market and hopefully we're going to make some extra money in return. That's always the goal of investing is to make money, not lose money. Um, investing is different from adding money to a savings or checking account because there's very little potential for growth when we just put it in our bank account. Now, savings accounts, you earn a little bit of interest, um, but really you don't earn very much, very, very little, just a couple cents here and there. So investing gives you the opportunity to make a lot more money. There, there's potential with that. Okay. So we're going to go through some 
vocabulary. This is probably things that you've heard. You could turn on any news station and you're going to hear a lot of this vocabulary. Um, and so we're just going to go through that. So if you have questions, please let me know if you need some more explanation, but we'll also, this will be on that YouTube. So you can definitely um, look at it and you don't see the slides. Yeah, Caitlin, the slides okay. Okay. Hold on one second. Can you see it now? Okay, great. Perfect. Okay. So shares, shares is a financial equity or security that denotes ownership in a public company. So that's a lot of language. So really what a share is, is that that's what you're owning. When you put money into the market, you're getting a piece of the pie. So you're getting a piece of this company that you now own. So if we look at it as a company is a whole pizza, you're getting a slice of that pizza. That's your ownership now. Um, and that slice will fluctuate, go up and down in price. So that's where we make our money. When it goes up, it's worth more. When this company is worth more, that's when we make money. When it goes down, we feel like we lose money. And I'm going to talk about that because you're not necessarily losing money. It's just worth less at the time. A stock is really the same type of thing. It's a slice of ownership in one or more companies. Now you can have a stock, you can buy a stock and it could be part of a mutual fund, which is our next vocabulary word, which means you're buying a slice of the pie in several companies. So several companies kind of are this one piece of pizza, excuse me, this one the, the pie, but you're going to buy a little bit of that in all these other companies. But a stock is saying, I'm going to own a little piece of this company. And that's kind of my, if you think of it like a, a ticket, like I own this part of this company with this ticket and that's a stock or a share. A mutual fund, like I was saying, is a financial vehicle or a financial way that several companies come together in this one pizza and now when you buy your slice, you own even smaller pieces of a lot of companies. So we will talk a little bit more about mutual funds, but um, a mutual fund could have 500 companies within it. And so I'm going to put my $10 and buy a share or a stock in this, um, in these 500 companies. So now I own $10 worth of all of 500 companies and together because they're pretty much like-minded. So these companies are often in the same industry or doing the same kind of thing. They're all together. So as they're growing or they're making more money, you actually have a lot less risk to lose your money. Um, so we'll talk about that later on, what that looks like with some of the, the vocabulary words that you probably have heard on the news all the time. So I'll explain that a little bit more, but mutual funds just mean we're all in this mutually where we've, there's lots of companies. It could be 10 companies. It could be 500 companies. It doesn't matter, but they're all within this one stock. And you're going to buy a piece of that pie with all of these companies. So mutual funds are actually a really, it's a lot safer to purchase when you're investing, especially when you're starting out, because there's a lot less risk involved. A bond, a bond is a fixed income instrument. So what this is, is you put money, you buy a bond and it may cost you $10 and they're going to tell you right away, you're going to get your money back in six months plus 2% interest. Um, so there's a fixed interest. You're going to know how much you're going to earn back. Um, you could buy bonds. You can go to a bank and buy a bond right away. You don't have to be in the market, the, the financial market to do so. You just have, you could go to the bank and do it. There's a lot of ways to buy bonds. It's basically an IOU. It's saying, I'm going to loan you some money and eventually you're going to give it back to me with some interest. It's a very, what we call conservative way of investing because you know that you're going to get your money back plus some more. So there's very little risk involved, but you earn very little on it two, three, 4%. That's not a lot of money when it comes to investing, but it's safe. So if you have a lot of people do bonds, if they know, you know, I have this money and I don't need it for five years, I'm not going to use it. I want to, I want to grow it a little bit, maybe buy, buy something big in five years. So they buy bonds because they know there's an ending point to it and they know they're going to make some money in return, but there's no risk of losing that money. So bonds are very safe. If you want to start investing, you just won't earn a whole lot. 
you will earn. You just won't earn a lot. Um, variable. This is just a term that goes for anything in the financial world. Variable. So you could have a variable rate. Um, and that just means that it's different, meaning something varies or can change. So when it comes to stocks, mutual funds, anything in the market, your return, so how much you're making back is a variable rate. It goes up and down. One day it could be one thing, the next day it could be something else. As you see on the bonds, it's a fixed income. You know how much you're going to get back. That doesn't change. When you buy it, when you buy into a bond, you're going to know how much you're getting in return and that doesn't go away. But in the market, we see things go up and down. It's because it's a variable. It never stays the same. And then the next one is fixed. I was just explaining that it doesn't, it, it doesn't change. So it's a set rate and fixed rates in the investment world, very rare, unless you're getting into bonds. Um, you're never really going to know how much you're going to make. That's the whole point of investing. We're taking a risk. Um, it could be up one day down the next. So fixed rates within the investment world, very rare, but when you take out a car loan, you'll get a fixed rate with that. Or if you're not getting a fixed rate, you need to find a car loan that has a fixed rate. <laughs> Always go for a fixed rate when you have a loan. Um, that way, you know how much you're going to have to pay every month and it doesn't change. If you ever buy a house, get a fixed rate. It means that you take out a home loan, you're getting a fixed rate. It doesn't change. It's going to stay that way now until you pay off the house in 30 years. So that does not change. And that's really important because interest rates go up and down and you never want to be charged more than yesterday when it comes to loans. Okay. So back to investing risk. I've said this a lot, um, in the game of, of investing, it's a risk. Everything we do in the investment world is a risk. And that means we're taking a chance that the outcome is actual gains. We're taking a chance that when I put my $10 in the stock market, that I'm going to build wealth because of that, that I'm going to get money back. We're taking a risk because it doesn't always happen, especially last year. We saw the market just tank this time last year. So people just saw their accounts go down, 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 but they've come up. It's done really well. It actually recovered very quickly, um, but that's the risk. You put in money and it goes down and comes back up and up and down. So we have internally what we call risk in excuse me, risk tolerance. Everybody's risk tolerance is different. And that's the emotional side of how risky you are. Okay. Um, if you're young, you can be very risky because you have time to build it back up. Um, I used to work in retirement. So I used to help people with their retirement accounts and, you know, for 50, 60 year olds that want to retire soon, they don't have time to be risky because they need to know that their money is going to be there. But the younger you are, the more risk you can likely handle. Now, I've met a lot of people along the way that are 25 years old that are not risky people. They're like, I have $10. I don't want to lose my $10. That's, that's a very anti-risky behavior. I don't want to lose this. How do I make just a little bit at a time? So we'll throw them into bonds because they know that they're going to get their money back plus a little bit more. So everybody is going to be different when it comes to risk. So I, when I invest, I'm not a huge investor. Um, I'm currently just investing my kid's savings account because he's young. <laughs> so for me, I know he, within this savings account, he's only three years old. We could be pretty risky because we have a lot of time to make that money back if we lose it. Um, for me, I am not necessarily a huge risky person. I'm more of like 50, 50, like let's throw some money into risky stuff. Maybe we'll make a lot more, you know, in return, but let's keep some of it safe. Like that's just who I am. Um, but I have met people. I, I worked with a guy one time that, um, he was an attorney. He was like 25 years old and he was the most risky person I have ever seen with his account. Um, because the higher the risk, the higher, the riskier you are, we say that there's a higher potential for return. So when you get into really risky situations within the stock market, they're risky because they could drastically go up or they could drastically go down. There's a lot of room for growth. Um, so the higher the risk, the higher the potential for return, you could actually make a lot more money when things are riskier. So 
but we all have a different risk tolerance and it, and there's no wrong or right answer to that. It's really what you can handle. So if you don't want to lose your $10, don't be risky. If you're like, well, if I put $10 in, maybe I can get 20 in return. That's a risky situation. And you can be as risky as you want to be. There's options for you out there to be risky, but you have to look internally at your risk tolerance. How much can you tolerate before you tap out? Compound earnings. So this has to do, maybe you've heard compound interest. Um, this is kind of a confusing concept, especially early on when you're investing, but compound interest means you've put in your $10 and you've earned, let's say a dollar in, in interest. So now you have $11 and what that extra dollar that you've earned does is it goes right back into your balance. So now you're investing $11. And so maybe next time you've earned a dollar 50 because you had that extra dollar in there. So now you have $12 and 50 cents. And so we're going to put that back in. And so as you earn interest on your, on your um, investments, we're putting your interest back into your investments. So you have more money. So we're growing that and that's called compound earnings. The more you earn, the more we're going to throw it back into your investment. So now you own more shares. Um, maybe you have more bonds, things like that. So as you earn interest, we're throwing it back to make your total grow. And that's how much more you're investing. And we're going to keep doing that every cycle. And the cycles could be weekly, monthly, yearly, depending on how you're investing. So compound earnings is how we actually earn our money. Because if we're going to earn extra money, we're going to put it back in the market. It's interest upon interest. It's kind of a tricky concept, but it actually just allows you to invest your earnings. That's what you're doing. When I earn money, I throw it back so that I can earn even more. And then I, when I earn even more, I'm going to throw it back and earn even more. So it's it keeps money from coming out of your pocket, but you're just using the interest that you've earned. And interest is the charge for the privilege of borrowing money. So like a bond, we said it's kind of like a loan. I'm going to loan you $10 and you're going to give me my $10 back plus another dollar. That's interest. That dollar was interest. So it's a privilege to borrow my $10 because it's mine. So if you borrow it, you got to give me something in return because that was a privilege to borrow my money. And that's how the stock market works with interest is it's a privilege for these companies to borrow your money from you. So they're going to pay you back with interest. Um, and then day trading. So day trading is what you see kind of on TV when we look at the stock market um, in New York. Those are day traders. Um, they're making purchases and selling. So they're buying shares and selling them on a daily basis, they go back and forth. So if they buy at $10 and by the end of the day, it's worth 15, they're going to sell off their shares all in a day. Um, retirement planning, when you, when you have a retirement fund, that's not day trading, that's long-term investing. So we put something somewhere and we just let it sit there and grow. And we're going to see the ups and downs with that, but we're going to wait, wait these things out. So day trading is just those who want to do buying and selling on the daily, maybe we do it one day and do it the next. That's what you see on a lot of these apps and we'll go through those. Um, so you don't have to be a day trader to be investing. And actually day trading is very risky. It's a very, very risky move, but there's a lot of potential for growth in that. But you gotta be quick. When the market shoots up, when, you're, when your stock is worth more than you paid for it, you sell it off. Um, but you're also taking the risk that it could go higher and you've just sold it off at a certain amount. So day trading can be tricky. It's not something people just dive into right away. Um, most people that I have seen get into investing, doing a little more long-term, even if it's like, I'm going to keep this here for a month, or I'm going to keep my $10 here until I make $15 off of it. That's more long-term rather than day trading, but you could totally be a day trader, even on these apps that you're using or might be using. Um, there's something called an index fund. So an index fund is a mutual fund. So mutual funds, remember, they're like all these companies could be 10 or could be 500. They're all kind of like-minded and they're all a part of this pizza. And that's what a mutual fund is. But an index fund follows the components of a financial market. So have you heard, F, uh, excuse me, not FDIC, um, I'm losing it, Dow Jones. Okay. When you turn on the news, you're going to hear the Dow, the Dow, the Dow, the Dow went up, the Dow went 
down. So the Dow is actually, and we'll get into this, um, is a mutual fund. It's an index fund. It's looking at the top, forget how many of this was, 30, 30 companies. It's been a while, but they're looking at the, these top companies in the investment market. So Microsoft, Apple, um, Amazon, Walmart, Target, big, big companies in the US. And they're putting them all together and averaging out their earnings. So the Dow is actually not something that we're saying that really dictates everything in the market. It's not going to tell you how your investment did. It's just giving you an average. And so an index fund follows that kind of thing. An index fund says, here's a mutual fund that you can buy into. And it's the top 30 companies in the U.S. Or it will an index fund will, will follow the S&P 500. That's another term you've probably seen on TV, S&P 500. That's the top 500 companies in the U.S. Um, and so you, there's an index fund out there that you could invest in the top 500 companies. And so it's just following the map of something else. Index funds, um, usually, because they're usually mutual funds, they sometimes have different prices with them. Um, but if you're looking for long-term investing, index funds are a really great way to go because they're following something that's already doing well, that's already put together. Um, and you're not picking out little pieces that maybe you don't completely understand. So index funds are just mapping, following a map of something else that's working. And then our last vocabulary word is volatility. So volatility simply means what is the mood of the market? Is it going up? Is it going down? So we can have high volatile days, which maybe they're like this. They're going up and down, up and down. We saw this last year um, during the beginnings of COVID, very volatile. Things shot up and then shot down. There was major loss involved. So that's a high volatility day or or period of time. Um, there's always volatility in the market. We're, we're never going to see a straight line. Your $10 share is not going to stay a $10 share. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. So we're going to have volatility, the waves of the market, but high volatility means high waves. There's major earnings and then there's a low earnings, major earnings. So there's always volatility. It's not going to go away. People use that word to explain how the day was. If you turn on TV, it was a high volatile day. The market's being really volatile today. That just means there's major ups and downs versus just our, our regular waves of investing, which is very normal. And we need that to happen. We also need highs and lows. We really do. And um, last year when COVID hit and the market kind of crashed, we were expecting something like that. Um, actually, in 2019, a lot of people were saying we had been going up. Everybody had been earning so well that investors were saying, like, it's going to go down. It has to go down. And then COVID hit and kind of forced it to go down. So it actually was a really good thing because what it does is things get really expensive for so long that it kind of interrupts our market because people at some point can't invest. It's just too much. And so we needed to go down to kind of even out so people can start investing again, getting their money in there so that we can bring it back up. So it's actually a really good thing when the market goes down. Now, the suddenness of it is not always the best, um, you know, COVID hit or in 2008, 2009, when the market crashed, um, nobody really wants it to crash in a day, but it's what happens in, and when we recover, that's when we see, okay, this was probably a good thing. The market's getting back on track, things like that. So those are high volatile days. We've dealt with that all of last year, just a lot of volatility in the market, um, a lot of ups and downs. So that's it for vocabulary for now. I mean, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary moving forward, but does anybody have any questions about anything in here? It's just our basic um, vocabulary. There's a lot to it. Um, I'll tell you some websites at the end that if you're interested in learning more about investing and learning, um, if you hear a word that you don't understand, I've got some really good websites to look at to just learn. So if you're into that, it, it, I'll, I'll make it really easy on you. Okay, so investment language. Okay, so now we're getting to the Dow. So we hear the Dow on TV a lot. What is the Dow? The Dow Jones Industrial Average is an index fund. So it's following a certain list that tracks the top 30 companies in the US. So this is the list right here. So when you hear on TV 
or on the internet, you know, the Dow did this today. They're looking at the average earnings of these companies. Okay. So Apple, American Express, Boeing, um, Caterpillar, Chevron, all these, all these major companies. And they just look at their earnings for the day. Now, Apple could do really well and Johnson and Johnson could be, could go down all in one day, but they're going to look at the average of that within this. That's why we don't see big numbers like, oh, it went up a point. It's because we're averaging out. Some people had some lows and some people had some eyes that were highs and we're going to average that out. Um, it doesn't mean that Apple didn't do really good today. So maybe you have stock, you own stock in Apple and you made a bunch of money. But if you look at the Dow, it says, oh, you only made very little. That's because they're looking at an average. So it's not always something that you want to look at when you're investing, especially early on, unless you happen to have money in all of these companies, you're really not going to, it really doesn't matter because most people um, buy into mutual funds and it's not all of these companies or something like that. So it's, don't let that scare you. If you get online or watch TV and they say, oh, the Dow went down today. Don't let it scare you because it, it doesn't dictate the whole market, um, especially right now, like Johnson and Johnson, I mentioned they're on this list. Um, they're dealing with COVID vaccines. And so they're pretty volatile. I think um, there's some, there's some other companies that they're in the news and they're either doing really well or really bad just because of COVID. Um, but don't let it scare you because it doesn't mean that Home Depot is not doing really great, which they have been because everybody went out and bought patio furniture because they're at home. So everybody was doing home projects last year. So home, um, like Home Depot's on this list. So Home Depot and Lowe's had super good sales because everyone was stuck at home. So, so though Johnson and Johnson may be rocky, Home Depot's doing great. So it's just the average of that, which is what the Dow reflects. And the S&P 500 is the same thing. So it's the top 500 companies um, in the U.S. So at the top of this list, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, all those major companies. And they're just going to look at the average of that. Um, so when the S&P S &P 500 moves a little bit, everyone thinks it's a big deal because we're looking at 500 companies. So, um, But if you're just going to buy into one company, you don't need to look at the S&P 500 because it's going to give you a more broader average. Okay, here's some websites that are so good. So like I said, I started in retirement services. So my job was to go out to companies and teach them about their retirement plan and help people invest in their retirement plans. And I didn't know what I was doing because this is not my background. This is not how I was trained. This is not what I went to school for. Money, I'm not good with math at all. Um, so I had to learn all of this. And these were the websites that I would go to. So if somebody was talking to me and they're going, oh, the market's volatile. And I would say, I don't know what that means. I would go on to Investopedia and put in, what does volatile mean? And they would give me the answer. It was super great because I could be really, um, like I could be really into learning and I could just read things, but then I would need to know what the vocabulary meant or what they were talking about, learning about mutual funds or IRAs or Roth, all these things within investing that I didn't understand. This is how I learned it right here. Market Watch, CNN Money and Investopedia. Really great websites if you want to learn. Um, Investopedia is like your encyclopedia of investing. It'll, they'll teach you basics to hard things. So I would highly encourage you to tap into those resources if you are interested in investing. Okay, so let's get into how you invest. There's several types of investments. There's several ways that you can invest. You don't have to be in the stock market. You can, but you don't have to be. So there's the stock market. You can invest in mutual funds. Um, having a retirement account is a form of investing because you're going to use your money in your retirement account and we're going to put that into an investment. So it's kind of a hands-off way of investing. Um, you can get CDs at the bank, which is certificates of deposits. <clears throat> it's a lot like a bond where you're putting a certain amount of money. You're loaning the bank a certain amount of money. And they're going to say, okay, in six months, in a year, in 10 years, whatever you sign up for, we're going to give you your money back plus a certain amount. So a CD is a very safe way of investing. You're not going to make a ton of money, but if you have some extra money and you want to put it away um, for, you know, five years or six months, whatever that looks like, a CD is a form of investing and it's very, very low risk. Um, you're not going to lose your money. You're just not going to earn a whole lot. A bond, we went through that. It's again, another form of a loan. You're loaning the bank money. 
and they're going to give that back to you within a certain amount of time with some interest. Um, buying or selling property. Um, so if you're able to buy a home, that's a great way of investing your money because the goal is that one day it's going to be worth more than you paid for and then you could sell it and make money back. So if you don't want to be in the stock market, buying and selling property is a really great, great way. Um, loaning money to the production of a good idea with higher return. So there are good ideas out there. People want to start like entrepreneurs want to start a business, but they look for um, people to come alongside them and loan them money to get their business started. And so people do that on a private level. So they'll, they'll loan, loan somebody money with a contract, like a legal contract that they're going to get that money back, or they own that much of that new company. And then they're going to earn money back. So there's, there's tons of ways of ways of investing without being in the stock market. If that's too risky for you. Um, and this isn't an all inclusive list. There's other ways of investing like your time. Some people just don't have money to invest, but investing your time in someone else, there's gain on the other side. So there's a lot of organizations that love having volunteers because you're, you're investing in someone else so that they can grow too. So that's another form of investments. Um, there's a lot of investing tools out there. Okay. Meaning there's a lot of online apps that make investing really easy for you. Our new one is called UB. UBT go. You do not have to have an account, like a checking or savings account with us. It makes it easier, but, um, we have a new investing app, which I'm going to show you a couple things on it. Cause they make it really easy. Um, I have been using web bowl. Um, so I deposit money into web bowl and then I get to choose my investments. I get to look at various things like, um, mutual funds, or if I want to invest in Apple, it's there. And I could look at their company. I could look at how they've been doing for the past day, five months, um, a year, five years. So I can look at that volatility. I can see what it's worth. I can get alerts. All of these type of apps do that minus UBT go. They make it a little bit easier. Robinhood is one. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard Robinhood has been in the news. Um, Ameritrade, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, all of these are online apps that you deposit money into it. You get to choose your investments. You could do day trading on them. You could do long-term um, investing. So they make it really easy. My suggestion is if you're going to do investing through an app like this, try a couple out, don't deposit money, but make an account with, with them, check it out. See if it visually fits what you're looking for. If it's confusing, don't use it. That's putting yourself at risk. Um, also, if you have to pay to invest, especially smaller amounts of money, you should not be doing that. So if you're paying this app to, invest your money. It, that's not a good way to start. Um, so Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Ameritrade, um, I do believe they have free options, especially if you're not putting a ton of money into these, but they tend to charge at a certain point. Um, when you buy shares, stocks, bonds, there will, you're, you should be earning money off that. You shouldn't have to pay. Um, and so I would just encourage you to find an app that works well for you and what you want to do. And we'll go through a little bit about what that looks like too, of like, how do you know if this works for you? Um, but I would encourage you to just set up a couple accounts and see if it works or go onto YouTube and watch videos about how does web bull work? How does Robin hood work? And people will walk you through it so that you can visually say, I don't have time for this, or this actually looks pretty easy. Let's go with this one. Um, the only reason I chose web bull was because I have a friend that used it and he showed me how to use it. Otherwise I'd probably be lost um, just because I was new to the online investing piece. So there are a lot of options out there. UBT go though. We're going to, I'm going to show you this because UBT go allows you to invest without having to pick your own investments. You don't have to know anything about the market. We're going to do it all for you based on how risky you want to be and your age and when you want to use the money. So you can say, I want to use this money in six weeks and we'll invest this money with for you to try to get you what you want, to try to get you the earnings that you want. So they, they make it pretty easy. So how hey, it works. Sorry, there was a question. Um, yeah. If we already have an account with UBT, do we have to create an, another account for investing? Yeah. So UBT Go, um, they it is a different it is a different app than just your um, your account. the The easy thing is is that you can transfer money from your checking or savings account at UBT 
right into the app for investing, which makes it really easy. And you can set up, you could do this from any, um, any bank account. So I, I have an account, my kid has an account at US Bank, and I still can connect his bank account with our investing account. It just takes a little bit more time to transfer the money in there, um, which I'll show you how that works. But no, y- yeah, you'll have, to, you'll have to sign up for that account, the investment piece of it. You have all. to sign up for the app. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah you app. do. So you don't have to create, you don't have to have another account, but it is a separate app. Correct. Um, yep. Normal. And we're going to blend those. They're still working on that so that when you open UBT Go, mm-hmm. you have the option of looking at your bank account and your investment side. And I'm opening up UBT Go right now to, to see if they actually have transferred that. Um, so I'll answer that once it, it loads. So yeah, we, we're going to make it e- even easier if you have an account with UBT, but you don't have to have an account with UBT. That's the great thing is you, if you don't bank with us, it's fine. Um, but we do make it a little easier. Yeah, it's not on there. So when I open up my account, I can see my checking, my savings. And for me, I have my HSA account with UBT because I work there, but eventually it'll say my investment account. So I can just go straight into that. So they're working on that right now. So, okay, so how it works, how does it work with these apps? So the objective or the goal is to deposit money into one of these apps and invest through them and then eventually get money in return, make your money back plus some. So for example, if you have $100 and company A is selling shares for $10 each, you can purchase 10 shares. So if I deposit $100 into my account, not UBT Go, but other accounts, um, and somebody is selling their shares for $10, I now own 10 shares of that company. Now, once it's invested, you decide when you want to sell those shares. So the cost of the share is when you determine when you want to sell it. So the price of your shares are now $15 each. So we started with 10 and now they're worth 15. So you sell your 10 shares and now you have $150 in your pocket, which means you've made $50. That's the goal of investing right there is whatever I bought it at, I need it to go up so that when I sell that, I can make money back. I can make more money back. So you, they made, this person made $50 on their hundred dollars, which is great. That's a lot. That's a huge increase for only hundred dollars. That's the ultimate goal of investing. Okay. Now the worst thing you could do is let me bring this up here. When there's volatility to sell when your shares are worth less. So you've bought 10 shares at $10 each, and now they're worth $5 because the market went down. Okay. What you do not want to do in this case is sell your shares. This is what happens. This is how people lose money is they think, oh my gosh, I've lost, lost this money. They're only worth $5. Now I have lost all this money. I need to take out what's left. That's the worst thing that you could do. This is how you lose money. And here's why, because if you were to just leave it alone, it will likely go back up. Okay. So your $10 shares are now worth five, but if you leave it there, the market may go back up and be worth 10 or 15 or 20. So when the market goes down and your account balance is less, leave it alone. Okay. That way you're, it's, you still own the shares. You still own those 10 shares, but we're going to wait until it goes back up and it's worth more to sell them off. Okay. So the example is you have 10 shares, worth $5 each. You bought them for 10. So this is our original. So we had a hundred dollars and we got 10 shares because they were $10 each, but now they're worth $5. Okay. So you've lost $5, $50 of your original investment. You haven't really lost it. It's just worth that. Now you still own 10 shares. That doesn't change. They're just worth less. So let's wait until the market goes back up and they're worth $10 again or 15. Just don't sell when things go low. In 0809, um, for those of you old enough to remember, um, people, the market crashed hard in 08 and 09. And a lot of people tell you now that they lost all this money in their retirement accounts. For some reason, retirement accounts were a huge issue, but that is because they sold all of their investments. They said, I had 100,000 in here. Now I only have 50,000. I have to save what's left. And so they pulled all their money out and now they have lost $50,000. 
Those who did not do that and just left it alone, actually, they're in the next 10 years, their accounts went up over 400%. Their earn, they dipped, but their earnings went so far past the original amount because they left it alone. So in any investment situation, when you when your account balance is going down, just leave it alone. That's the worst time to sell because you are going to lose your shares and you've lost that money now. That's the whole idea of market volatility is just things are going to go down. It will. They always will. But let's wait for it to go back up on the other side so that we can earn some money. Long-term investing when it comes to like retirement accounts, um, or maybe you just put money into these apps and you just leave it alone. Just know that you're going to see a lot of the ups and downs and that's okay. So one day you might look and your account balance is low and the next day it might've shot up. It's really up to you when you want to sell, but if you've lost money in your account, that's not a good time to sell. Um, and our compound earnings. So some investments, some shares, stocks, whatever it is, they pay out their earnings. So that interest either weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, yearly. And so when you're doing long-term investing and a company pays you interest for your, for your share, we're just going to put that right back in. It automatically goes back into your investment. So that's how we do compound earnings is every time you're getting your money, um, your earnings, we're just going to put it back into the account balance. So um, that's how long-term investing works is we're just using our earnings and putting it back into the account to earn more. Um, but for those of you who are just looking to invest, you know, a, a little bit here and there, the long-term investing and the compound earnings are not going to add up for you, which is okay. Um, hey, comp we yeah. We have a question. I don't okay. know if you've seen it. Um, so when would a good time to invest be and how do you invest into something? Yeah, I don't know. If that's, that's a great question. Like I mean, that is, that is the ultimate question when it comes to investing. And here's why we never know if something is cheap enough. We never know if it's going to go down. So if we're looking to buy something, we want to buy it when it's low, when it's mm -hmm. cheaper. Cause if we have, if we only have a hundred dollars to spend, we want to get the most for our money. So what I do is I track a couple companies that I want to invest in. Say you really like Apple and Microsoft and you're like, I really want to get in on this. So a lot of those apps have what's called watch lists. So basically you can put them in your favorites and just keep an eye on them. You can keep going back and looking at how they're doing. Um, when you're comfortable buying for that price, that's when it's time to buy it. If you say, you know what? I like this price. I'm okay with it. Um, let's buy. That's when you're going to buy. Now you don't want to buy at a peak. So if you look at their, their track records and they're all over the place, you don't want to buy at the top because it's, it, it's going to be very risky. It may not go any higher. So you want to buy when it's lower, when you know that, you know, maybe there's been some volatility, maybe it's gone up and down. And right now we're at a low. So let's buy at a low. Cause you could buy more, more shares because they're cheaper so that when it goes back up, you're earning more with that. So you never want to buy at a peak unless for some reason you have insider information that says it's going to go way beyond that peak. Um, but buying at a low is good. So last year when the market tanked, um, a lot of people put a lot of money into the market at that point because everything was so cheap. It had bottomed out. Everything was inexpensive. And so they bought a bunch, which actually brought our market back up because people are like, well, I'm going to put money into all of this because it crashed and burned and we know that it's going to go back up. So that's a good time to buy or when you are comfortable buying, that's when it's, you have to look at your risk. You have to look at what's best for you. So if you're comfortable paying the price of this share, do it. That's, that's completely up to you. Someone said, I have Robin hood app and I only input money once. Is there better, is it better to keep putting money into it or just let whatever I put in grow? So I'm guessing what you're asking is you've put, you've put your money in one time and you're not adding to that balance. That's completely up to you. Some people do that. They put a chunk of money in and they say, this is all I'm re really willing to risk. I don't want to lose any more than this. If that happens, um, some people will add a little bit at a time. The UBT go app allows you to set up um, automatic transfers. So what I did for my kiddo is I put money into his account every month. It's like $25, but I set it on a timer that that 
goes from his account into his investment account. So I'm only adding $25 a month for him, but if I ever want to stop that, I can. So if you, if you only can afford to put in a chunk of money once and play with that, go for it. If you want to add more later, go for it. Um, it's really up to you. There's no, there's no right or wrong way to invest. There really isn't. It's all about risk tolerance. Like we talked about, um, um, what can you handle individually? How do you know which stock to invest in? That's really up to you. It's your interest. Do you like the stock? Um, do you agree with the company and what they're doing? Because essentially you're loaning them your money. So do you agree with them? Do you want them to do more with your money and try to earn you money? Um, stocks that are like our S and P 500, the top 500 companies, those tend to be a little more expensive. So we, we can't always like, I, I can't afford an Apple stock. Like it's so expensive and Microsoft, like I'm not buying into that because I don't have the money to do that. So I look at other smaller companies like startup companies. Um, they may have, it may be a really small company, but you could buy stock in it. The great thing about startup companies, they're very, very risky. Because if you think of what Uber was before Uber is, Uber was this company that decided to drive people around. Now that could have done really well or really bad. Okay. As a startup, that's what people are looking at. This may be a really good idea or this may not. And so people invested in Uber and look what it is. It's huge. It was a huge company. It took off. And so everybody who, who was investing in that in the initial stages made a bunch of money because it was a really good idea. Now there's startup companies that you may think are a really great idea and maybe they are, but it doesn't take off. So you bought this stock and it just tanks. So startups have a lot of room for growth because it could be a really good idea. Now there's companies out there that right there in the middle. Um, they're not huge. They're not your Apple or Microsoft, but they're doing their job well and, and investing in them. Maybe you can get a decent amount of return on that because they're doing well. They're not crashing and burning. They're just kind of floating by um, and doing well. Some people like to invest in bigger companies like Target and Walmart, because even when the market crashes, even when the world kind of stops like it did last year, we still needed toilet paper. So guess which companies continue to do well? Target and Walmart and Home Depot and big companies like that. So there was less risky because we still needed things. And those were the companies we went to, to get them. Amazon, one of those companies really expensive, but the world kept turning in Amazon land because we all couldn't go anywhere. And so Amazon took off last year because of the pandemic. So it really depends on what you think a good stock is. What are you interested in investing in? Um, if you're risky, go for small companies, go for um, startup companies. If you're pretty conservative, you want to play it safe, go for the big companies. What can you afford? What can't you afford? Um, how long do you want to be investing? Startup companies like Uber um, took years to get where they are. So you may invest in a startup and you may not see any return for 10 years. So do you have that kind of time? Are you going to wait that out? Really depends on what you want to do. So if we all knew what a good stock would be to invest in, we'd all be rich, right? If we all knew the answer, we'd all be rich. Um, so it really, investing is really an emotional decision about what is right for me. How much time do I have? How, how risky can I be? And how much money do I have? If I don't, if I don't have a lot of money, then I got to be very, very picky about where I'm putting this money, which means mutual funds might be a really good idea because you get to invest in a lot more companies at a smaller amount of money. So really great question that was, I'm sorry, I can't give you a really good answer, except it's up to you. That's the beauty of investing. Um, so you know, if you're, if you start getting into investing and, and you tell your friends, you know, I, I invest in an Apple or Microsoft and they start yelling at you because that was a dumb idea. It, it, it wasn't a dumb idea. It's your decision on what you want to do with your money. And if you, if you want to do that, if you feel like that's the right decision, then go for it. And maybe you'll make some money on the long way. That's our, that's our goal. So there's never a right or wrong way to invest. That's what I've told everybody. It's an emotional decision. Um, so you have to look at what's best for you which can be hard because it's very risky. Um, we risk losing money. I'm going to 
skip through here a little bit for the sake of time. Um, okay, so there is what we call a compound earning calculator. This is that concept of we're going to put our interest that we've earned back into our investments. Um, I have this really great calculator just to show you kind of how it works. I'm going to open it up here. Um, this is actually on investor.gov. So it's a government site. I'm going to switch my screen share here. Is that showing up? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So compound earnings, we're saying over time, I'm going to invest in something. Let's say that we put $10 somewhere and monthly contributions. I'm not going to put anything more in there. I'm just going to keep it at $10, but it's in there for about, let's say two years. Okay. Estimated interest rate. This means how much money am I going to, to earn? Okay. I, I like to just use 10%. It doesn't always mean that I'm going to earn 10%, but I like to look at that as an average and then interest rate variance range. I'm going to leave that alone. That just means like, will it fluctuate? We're just going to leave that alone. So compound frequency, how often is this stock that I'm buying paying me interest? Um, you can look, if you dig deep enough, Morningstar is a great way to look at that information. It's an investing site. You could look up any stock and they'll give you, or mutual fund, they'll give you all the information about it. So let's just say that, um, this stock that I put $10 in pays me interest every single day. And that's what we're kind of looking at with day trading. We're going to earn something every day, hopefully. Okay. So I have $10. I bought $10 worth of a stock. I'm going to keep it in there for two years. We're going to earn 10% on this on it. No, we're going to go smaller. We're going to earn 5% every day on this stock, which was not going to happen. This is a very unrealistic way of looking at investing because it doesn't always go up. We're not always earning. It is going to fall, but we're just going to, I just want to bring up this example. So you understand compounding interest. So if I'm earning interest every single day and we're throwing it back in to that investment, this is how much we're going to have in two years. So we'll have $11 and five cents. Okay. It doesn't seem like a whole lot, but if let's say that we had a thousand dollars and it did the same thing, two years, 5% interest every single day. So instead of having a thousand dollars, I now have a $1,105 because every day we've took that interest, that 2% interest threw it back in. So now we're earning interest on even more. And so the next day I earned a little bit more interest and we're going to keep throwing that back in. So that's how compounding interest works. We're just, instead of taking the interest or the money earned and putting it in our pockets, we're going to reinvest it. And we're just going to keep growing that. So if we have like retirement accounts and we're keeping it, we put a thousand dollars in there. We never contributed more, but we have it in there for 30 years and an average of 10% annually. My thousand dollars in 30 years is going to turn into almost, uh, well, over $17,000 because we're earning money. We're putting it back in earning money, putting it back in. That's the, that's the idea of compounding interest. So compounding interest is only effective if you're doing long-term investing. Um, you're not buying and selling, buying and selling. This is just something that you're putting money into and you're just letting it sit. So I just wanted to bring that up because it's kind of a hard, it's a hard concept to grasp. Um, but it, um, it is something that you're going to hear people talk about a lot. Um, okay. Any questions on this? Cause this is the end of my presentation, but I wanted to show you this app information on this app. If you're looking to invest. We do have a question here. Okay. In the chat box. Yeah. Um, what's a good way to invest in your business and also your child and self? Um, how do you know the difference? Okay. So you have a small business or a, a business yourself, and you're wondering what's a good way to invest in your business. I actually am not a good person to answer that question. Um, we have small, a small business banker here at UBT that would love to answer those questions, not to talk you into anything, but to have this conversation. I am not an investor in business, so I am not good at that. So I'm, I'm going to park that one. Cause I'm, I don't want to say anything that I will regret later, <laughs> but how do you invest in your child and self? And how do you know the difference? So there's, um, okay. Stay, um, whoever that was stay on the line after, 
um, and I'll get you the information or get your information and pass it on to the small business maker. Okay. So how do you invest in your child and self and how do you know the difference? So if you're talking about investing in the market, um, like what we're talking about today with stocks, um, one way to do it is just to have different accounts. So like I have an account for my kiddo cause he's only three. So I have enough time. My goal is to have use some, my $25 a month and put him through college later. So I've got, you know, 15 years that I can be investing $25 a month. And that's the goal. Um, your child, there's different ways to do that. If you want to do investing, like I'm doing, there's 529 accounts, which are, um, investing, for education. So you could put in money when you can, doesn't have to be consistently, but it's specifically for your child and will invest it. And kind of like a retirement account, it's long-term so that you can use those, that those dollars for their college later. It's really great. And if you don't use it for them, you could use it for another child or anyone that you want to give that to. Um, you could do that for yourself too. You could have a 529 account for yourself. If you want to go back to school and want to invest money. Um, but if you're talking about just investing, like we're talking about today, have different accounts. Um, Cause I'm, I'm consistently investing for my child on a monthly basis, my investment account. I'm not always putting money in there. I'm doing it when I can. And so if you want to keep that separate, that's a good idea too, but there's also different ways to invest besides the market in your child and yourself. Um, maybe it is just opening up a savings account or, um, opening up a CD or getting some bonds so that you're earning a little bit of money over time, but it's not risky. So you're, you're not taking the risk of losing it. So a bond or a CD can be opened up in the bank. You just have to walk in and they'll open it up or go through the drive through um, at UBT. Our branches are open though. So you could actually go in now. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of ways. Um, this is a conversation. I would love to know kind of what your goals are. Um, what, what are you trying to invest in? What's the end result? Cause there's a lot of things that we could do. So we could talk after, or you could take down my information, um, which I will put it on the screen right now. If you have more questions and by the way, just real quick, you do not have to be a UBT customer, um, in order to meet with me, I do financial coaching. So if you ever have questions or want to build a budget or just talk about goals, I, this is a free service I offer to anyone. And I'm not going to talk you in to opening up an account with UBT or getting a credit card. I don't know how to do that stuff. It's not what I do. I, I'm not allowed to do that stuff. So if you just want to talk through things, I met with someone the other day for financial coaching and she banks with us bank and that's fine. I'm still going to work with her. That's not a problem. I bank with us bank. So I have a bank account with UBT and other banks. So, um, I do the same thing. So you can always contact me. That's my information. Um, just for questions, or if you want to meet with me on a monthly basis, I'm happy to do that too. So whatever you need. Um, yeah. So let's talk about that. Okay. So I'm going to pull up here some videos. We have this great account, UBT Go, that offers a really easy way to invest. And what it is, is you're putting money into this account and based off your age and when you want money, we will do the investing for you. So I have this investment account. I'm not going to show you mine, but I put for my son's account, you know, I don't need this money for 15 years. And so they're going to go really risky because remember higher risk, higher potential for return. They're saying that you might have time to watch this account go up and down, up and down. So they're going to invest. UBT is going to invest on my behalf in mutual funds usually to try to earn me a good amount of money in the next 15 years, try to maximize my return, try to get as much as I can. I never see the investments. I have no idea what they're investing in. That's what's so great about it. I can just put money in this account and walk away. And every day I'm looking at my earnings. I get, I can get alerts. I can go into the account and see, oh, I earned this much yesterday or, oh, I didn't. So that's, what's really great. Now my investment account, I put a little bit of money in there and I said, I want this, I want to use it in two years. So they're going to be pretty risky, but they're going to keep some of it safe. So they're probably going to put some money into some bonds or money market accounts, which is basically a savings account, just to make sure that in two years I have my balance. Um, I don't want to lose money in two years, but that's a small amount of time to invest. Um, so there, I have two different investment accounts with them doing two different things, but I do not have to worry about what investments they're putting in it. I don't have to choose that. The only thing I'm they're investing is based off my age and how risky I want to be. And I get to tell them that 
I get to mark that down. I want to be really risky or I don't. It's a scale, um, which is really nice. This app is not for people who have tens of thousands of dollars that are investing. That's not what this is for. Um, this is for people who want to get started, who don't know what they're doing, who want to who want to start investing now while they learn, while they learn the language, while they learn how to do it on their own. So I I use this because I was using WebBull but I don't have time anymore to track my investments. So I moved it all over into UBT go so that they could do it for me. And I could be pretty hands off. It doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm choosing to say, I just don't have time for this. So you do it for me. And I don't have tens of thousands of dollars that I've put into this account. It's really not that. And so um, it's perfect for me because I don't have to worry about it, but it's also perfect for you as you're learning to just have your money somewhere, even if it's $10 or a hundred dollars to have it start investing while you're learning everything else. So I'm going to play this video really quick. It's four minutes and it's just talking about how to open up the account so that you can see visually what you're looking at and what the questions they're going to ask you. Um, because the, it's really easy. And I just want to make sure people know, and this is not my huge plug for you to open up this account, but I'm guessing you're on this webinar today because you're interested in investing and getting started. So this is a really easy way to start. And I don't make any money off of this. So it's not like if you open up an account, I'm going to, I'm going to earn anything from it. So don't, don't worry about that. I'm not trying to talk you into this, but okay. Can you all see this YouTube? Yes. Okay, great. Are we good on time? This is yes. hour and a half, right? Okay. Okay. Share sound. Okay. Here we go. Can you hear that? To start your online investing adventure with UBT. Yes. Okay. Visit ubt.com slash invest online and click on get started. From here, select the service here that makes the most sense to you and click on open online to begin the account opening process. Start by entering some personal information, your email address, and create a password. You can see the requirements for the password below the new password field. Shortly after submitting this information, you will receive an email at the address you provided with instructions on how to verify your account. You don't need to stop what you're doing to take care of that email right away, but you will need to complete the verification before you can log into your online investing account. You can see now we have five steps to complete the account opening process. Step one has you enter your annual income and the amount you're planning to invest. This amount isn't necessarily how much you're planning to deposit right away as you'll set up those individual or recurring deposits a little later. Step two has you select a goal and enter a date when you think you might want to use the money you've been investing. To learn more about these goals, check out our other videos on what the different goals mean for your investments as well as how to add or change your goals. So if you're not confident which goal to select here, just know that you can change it later. Step three is a five question risk tolerance questionnaire. Answering these questions will determine your asset allocation. As you're answering the questions, you'll notice changes in the risk tolerance gauge on the right. These changes do not represent your overall risk tolerance. They are only representative of the current question you're answering. After you've answered all five questions, you'll see a summary of your overall risk tolerance score and the goal and date you selected earlier. If you'd like to set your risk score manually, you can click and drag the blue dot left to right along the track to set the score to the number of your choosing. Scrolling down, you'll see how your investments will be allocated based on your risk tolerance score. If you'd like to make some changes before you proceed, you can click on retake risk questionnaire to go through the questions again. And just like your goals, these selections are not permanent. We have another video showing how you can retake the risk questionnaire or even manually set your risk score in the future. Step four has you select what type of funding account you'd like to open. You can see a summary for each of the three account types. But if you'd like to learn more, we have a video where our experts talk about the differences between these three. And now step five, the final step. You'll need to enter some current contact information phone number, address, and mailing address. If your mailing address matches your personal address, you can check the box to automatically fill that information in. PO boxes are perfectly acceptable for the mailing address, but you will need a physical address for the top section. 
Next up, you'll need to fill out some employment information and then select yes or no for the three personal affiliations questions. On the next page, you'll enter your marital status, and if you'd like, you can add a trusted contact or beneficiary. A trusted contact is someone you would like us to reach out to in case we can't get a hold of you for an extended period of time. A beneficiary is used on retirement accounts and is the person or entity you choose to inherit the retirement account after your death. After that, you'll have the opportunity to review all the information that you entered to make sure it looks accurate. Once you've looked over your personal information and scrolled to the bottom of the page, you can click the links in the gray area to review your account opening documents. If everything looks good, check the box and click on Open My Account. Congratulations! You've taken your first steps towards online investing with UBT. In the next steps section, you'll see a reminder that you need to check your inbox and verify your email address before you can log into the account summary page. Once you're all verified and signed in, if you'd like some help adding funds, we have a separate video about that topic too. Vocabulary wise, we didn't go over that I want to explain because any app that you use are going to ask you these questions. Okay. Really quick though, these tiers, when you're looking to open an account, if you the tier two and tier three are for, for folks that are putting large amounts of money in and want to have more hands-on contact with somebody to invest. And we're talking tens of thousands of dollars here. So most people and what this app is designed for is this tier one. Okay. There's no minimum that you have to have in there. You're not paying a fee. The, the trade to like buy and sell are, are free. So this is even what I did was this tier one. It's the easiest way to go. Secondly, um, not the sign in, definitely verify your email. You're going to get a lot of emails that will help you step by step, which is really nice. Okay. So some people have asked, why do you have to have your income in there and how much you plan to invest? It, it really is just to help them know how to invest your money. They, they're really not going to do it much with this information. They just kind of want to know, like, especially how much you're going to invest. What's your goal here? So I think I put for my kiddo, it was like $500. It doesn't mean I put that all in there, but eventually I want to get like 500 bucks in there. That's that, that was really all that I had to do. And they base out your age. That's super important because they want to know how risky, how much time do they have to invest with your account? Okay. This is, this is the big thing here. Um, they want to know how long you're going to be investing. So if you just want to do something for fun, general investing is the way to go. If you're looking for a retirement account, retirement preparation, that's a whole nother ball game. That's, that's going to be long-term. You plan not to take this money out of the account. You kind of don't touch it. Um, if you want to buy a house, put, you know, major investment, if that's your ultimate goal with this money, I think for, for my kiddo, I did major investment because I want him to go to school. That, so I, I'm telling them basically, I'm going to use this money for college in 15 years so that they know how to invest that correctly. So that they could be really risky with that money, try to earn more. So it's very, it's really just for them to know. Um, it doesn't have to be accurate, but I would say the retirement ones don't press that unless you're really looking to keep your money into this account for like 30 years. Um, everybody's pretty young on this call. So, I mean, that would be a really long time of investing. And then this plan to use the money that that's a real, that's super important because for my kiddo, I've got 15 years before I'm going to use this money. So that's what I put is 15 years from now so that they know that's the, that's the key is how long until you're going to use this money. Cause that's going to determine how they invest your money. Um, this risk tolerance, this is for you to just say, what is my tolerance? How, how, risky do I want you to be? So sell all of your stock and lock in the gain. Like how, what are you interested in doing? Selling a portion of the stock. I'm going to do nothing. I want to buy more. I think I did buy more because I'm constantly putting money in there. So it's just to know again, how risky they can be. But then once we get to this other screen, you can toggle that line back and forth. If you're like, I don't want to be hundred percent risky. I want to be a little safe. Let's, let's keep a little balance just in case it's pretty volatile. Um, so you get to determine that and then put in your goal. So my goal was college.
for my kiddo? And then when do I plan on using the money? 2000 and I don't know, whatever, 15 years from now is 36. Yeah. 36. So we know that it's going to be a long time. Um, this is how they, this is what they're going to tell you how they're going to invest. So equities mean stocks, things that you're going to earn in equity and equity, like in a house would be, you know, it's, it's worth 200,000, but I only owe 150,000, which means you have $50,000 in equity in your house. You have that much earning. So that's the same with the stock market. I'm going to put my money here and I want growth. I want to see extra money earned off it. That's an equity fixed income. That is the safe stuff. That's like your bonds or your money market where I'm going to put money in and I'm going to know exactly how much money I'm going to get back. So that fixed rate, I know that if I put $10 in here, I'm going to get $11 back. I'm going to earn a dollar. So that's what that is. And then cash would be a money market account. That's like basically opening up a savings account where you're going to earn very, very little money, but your cash, the money in your savings account never dips. It just doesn't grow that much. So some of this is safe. And if you don't like that, if you don't want any cash, if you want to put that all into the stock market, all equities, just go back and change your risk to be a hundred percent. So equities is where we earn a lot more money. There's higher potential for earning. So they just want to know how that's going to work. And they're going to show you. Marie, for each of the this three is this page here. But if you'd what like to learn more, we want. have a video so where our experts is probably talk about be the, the most common for three. any of you on the line. Oops. And now um, they individual is just that investment account that's in the stock market. A traditional IRA or a Roth IRA are your retirement accounts. So those are going to work very differently. So if you're not looking to save for retirement, just use an individual account. You do not need to worry about the IRAs. The IRAs kind of lock it in. You can't use that money um, when you want to with IRAs until you are 59 and a half. You can't touch your money unless you have a, um, a, what's it called? A, uh, a good reason. There's certain reasons that the government deems as appropriate to get to your retirement account. Right now it's kind of loosened up because of COVID, but, um, usually you can only do it if there's a, um, if you're going to school or you're buying a house or there's like a natural disaster that you have to have this money. So there's very particular reasons that you're taxed on it. You're charged a penalty. So if you're going to invest in an IRA, just know that you can't just take that money out. You can't just sell your stocks and take the money. You're going to pay taxes and you're going to pay a penalty if you're under 59. So if you're looking to take this money out eventually, go with the individual account. Okay. Don't lock it up in a retirement account. I think that was kind of it that I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on, um, to make sure. But if you ever have questions, you could certainly call me. Oh, beneficiaries and trusted. Um, this is if there was some, if something happened to you, where does this account go? Where does the money go in your account? So I put my son cause it's going to be his, everything I have is going to be his. Um, if you're married, it's in the state of Nebraska, your beneficiary has to be your spouse. Um, so you might as well just put your spouse there. Um, especially for retirement accounts. Um, but if you have a trust or a will, you could put that in there too. So this is just, if something were to happen to you, who gets the money out of this account? Um, yeah, I think that was kind of it. Does anybody have any questions? I will, I will tell you that any app you sign up for to invest are going to ask you the same questions. That's why I wanted to be clear that you understood the, the language of it, because you will be asked these questions, especially beneficiaries who gets this account. If something were to happen to you, what's your risk tolerance, things like that. So you will be asked these questions. If you, especially I know web bull Robin hood, you can open up retirement accounts on there. So I just want to make sure you, you know, too, that you will be penalized. If you take money out of your retirement retirement account. You can move your retirement account to other retirement accounts, but you cannot cash that out for, for just the fun of it. You can't. So don't lock your money into a retirement account if you want to use it. But is there any other questions? If you question. go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was wondering, so with this kind of service with UB, UBT Go or with another that it's getting managed by experts mm -hmm. is there a way to like it's important to me for what i'm investing in to be somewhat like that i ethically agree with the yes. companies. yeah is there options to specify that within ubt go or is that should i find like a different kind of app that allows me more choice and you agency? know that's a really great question that actually came up this week um with something else i was doing 
I'm going to, I'll reach out. If you, if you leave me your contact info at the end of this, I'm going to reach out to our main investors who do this behind the scenes and ask them if somebody wanted to be very ethically minded. And actually I was having a conversation with him. His name is Craig about this because it's coming up. It might be that we, it's not an option with UBT at this level, but I could certainly find out for you. Um, and then I do a podcast, um, for UBT and we, it's called money better. If you, we're going to do an investing, we're recording this week. So in a month, we're going to release an investing podcast on how to invest, how to do it wisely, things like that. And we'll bring up that conversation too. It's actually with Craig. So we're going to talk about that and how to be mindful of that. Um, the best advice I could give you right now or suggestions is to do some research on Morningstar. Um, you could pay for Morningstar service where you can get into the nitty gritty of mutual funds who's in it. but um, there is at least if you're looking at mutual funds, um, they'll give you the top earners for that mutual fund. So you're not going to see all of them, but you'll see a lot of them. And I will say that within the top earners, you're going to get a general idea if it's ethical or not within your, within your standards. So you're going to see the apples and, and targets and Starbucks. And so if that doesn't line up, probably none of the other ones will too. So I would encourage you, if you're trying to be ethically minded, um, mutual funds may not be a good way to go because there's so much involved in that, but there are ethically minded mutual funds out there and you just have to do a little bit of research on that. Um, I know especially in Nebraska, a lot of companies are very Catholic minded, like Madonna is one of those. And when they do their investing, they have a lot of people who, especially in retirement accounts, will only do certain ones because of the ethical reasons behind it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just takes a little extra research to figure out what, what will work for you. But I know there's a lot of companies out there that will offer that information specifically for that type of investing. So let me talk to Craig about that within UBT Go and I'll get back to you. So stay on when we end and I'll take your info down and get back to you about that. So that's a great question. Um, it's definitely coming up more and more in the investment world. So really great question. Thank you for that. Um, somebody asked, I worked um, at Nelnet for years. I received a 401k, but haven't gotten any information since last time I worked at the company. Should I look into it? Yeah. It, um, all you have to do is call Nelnet and, or UBT. Cause we actually hold their, we run their retirement plan. So if you are, I'm going to put it in here, Jason Hemingway. If you email him, he's in charge of the Nelnet 401k plan. So if you would like to get access to that or move it or find out your account balance, contact him. I just put the email in there and he'll get you all the information. So he is your direct contact for Nelnet. All right. At UBT, is there any way to speak about assisting new businesses and building up for funding? Yes, I can get you the new, the small business contact. She's great. Um, she's the one to email right there. So if you have any small business questions just to get started, how do I fund it? Loans. Um, investing, anything small business oriented, even if you just want a small business checking account, she'll go through all of that with you. She works with me often, um, especially with the nonprofits that we're working with around the community. She's super great in getting you the right information um, to start or to fund your small business. And do you have to pay for that? Nope. Just call her, just call her and ask. She's not going to charge you to talk to you. Um, there are services that you'd have to pay for if you chose to go that way, but there are small business accounts out there. Um, as long as you have your, your, I, I don't know what it's called, but your ID, your tax ID, you can open up an account. It's a $500 minimum to open up this account, but we could get that waived for up to a year if you're building up that balance too. So, um, for small businesses, if you're looking for a particular, checking or savings account so that you can start writing checks or receiving funds for your small business, we can get that for you. Um, and you don't have to pay to talk to Stephanie. She'll, she'll uh, set you up with that. So definitely Stephanie is your contact for small businesses. Okay. Great questions, everyone. I love this. So is, is there other questions as we're kind of winding down? Can you talk about how to tell whether to pay off debt before investing or savings or when Yes. Okay. Great, great question. Okay. And I was talking to Craig, our investor about this too. Um, you can do what you want. This is not me telling you what to do. Okay. 
But the best way to invest is to pay off your debt first because you are being charged interest on your debt. So if you have credit card debt, you're likely, your interest rate is likely 15 to 30% interest. You're not going to earn that much when you're investing. You're not. So therefore, you're being charged on your credit card more than you're going to earn by investing. So pay off that credit card. Use the money that you want to put in your investment account and pay off your debt because you're not, you're going to continue to lose money by being charged interest. Um, I am a big fan of only investing if you don't have debt. Now, when I say debt, you know, most of us have car payments that that's going to look a little different. If you own a home, you know, to, to say, pay off your home first, that's not realistic. Um, but if you've got credit card debt, you owe people some money, store credit cards, um, a personal loan within reason, pay off that debt as fast as you can, especially collections, um, medical debt, because your interest rate is really high or your penalties are really high. So I would I would definitely say pay off your debt first. Now, if you have school loans, that's another one. How much are your school? You don't have to put that on there, but if you've only got a little bit of school loans left, try to try to just plug away at that because your interest for school loans is usually under 10%, but it still can be a lot of money. You know, five, 6% on $15,000 is a lot of money. And so if you could plug away with at that, then do it. Some people like to invest so that they could take their earnings and pay off their debt. And it, you're going to accrue more interest. You're going to be charged more interest than you're going to earn. You just will. That's the nature of having debt. So don't do that to yourself. Craig would tell you, Craig works with, um, he's a financial advisor. So he works with people that come to him with tens of thousands of dollars to invest. And he will tell you, I will not help you invest if you have debt. He tells rich people that if you have debt, I'm not going to help you um, because that's not how you build wealth. You can't build wealth when you have debt. Okay. So I'm a, I'm, I work with folks that don't have a lot of money that have debt instead of having wealth. And that's what I do for a living. And I will tell you the same thing. I would not advise, well, I cannot advise you to do anything, but I would not encourage you to open up an investing account if you have debt. Okay. So like for me, I have school loans and I have a car payment and I own my house. Those are, those are big debts that I just can't plug away with all at once. So I put a little bit in my investing account, but my goal is not to use my investing account to pay off my debts. It's just extra money. But if I had credit card debts or medical debt, I would not put any money in my investment account. Um, I hope that's, that's clarifying. You do what you want and I'll help you do what you want. If you, if you need help investing um, on the, especially UBT go, or if you have questions, I will honor what you want to do, but just know that you will not earn enough money investing to pay for the interest rate that you are being charged for your debt. So you might as well get that paid off first. Um, how do I sign up for a business loan or account? You can go on our website if you want to, or you can email steph.dinger at ubt.com, stephanie.dinger. I put that in there a little bit ago. Um, I'll put it in here again. And um, also with um, a lot of you, it sounds like you all are interested in either starting your own business or you have your own business. Mm -hmm. We do have our entrepreneur series that is coming up in May yeah. um, with Caitlin and some of the topics that we are talking about um, during that series are personal accounts versus business account, yep. um, your interest rates, your fees, your terms, um, how to shop around for the best. Um, a variable versus fixed income, how to calculate your profit, how long until you make a profit, how do you borrow, understanding debt before you even get a loan. So we talked about that a little bit here. Um, understanding credit and how it relates to borrowing, personal finances and how they affect your small business ability, mm -hmm. and then what bank accounts would be best in grants. Yeah, we're going to go through all of that. And I'm probably yeah. going to try to have Stephanie or her, um, another small business banker, come on and, and talk through a lot of this. Um, but you could definitely reach out to them and ask them these questions if you don't want to wait until May, but we're going to talk through a lot of that. And I'll even show you our website where you sign up for small business information. If you're looking for an account and like the terms and conditions of those accounts and things like that, um, for small businesses that want to start within the nonprofits, um, like we're on right now, we can get some of these fees waived 
Mm -hmm. um, for up to a year. So if you're really just starting out, but you're like, I've got to get a business account because I'm getting paid or I want to get paid, um, or take payments, like we can, we can work with you on that. So, um, stick around for that. That would be a, a good one for you. So the small business stuff is coming up, but if you do have questions, I mean, you could reach out to me or you could reach out to Stephanie and I could get some, some information, um, passed along. Um, but she would be your first stop is Stephanie, Stephanie Dinger at ubt.com. Any other questions? We have a hand raised. Go okay. ahead. Oh, yeah. Hi, Somebody I, asked. Because I, I kept sending to Vic. I don't know how, but it kept, the question kept going to Vic, and I did not try to do that. <laughs> what? Say that. What was the question? The question wasn't going to, to the group. It kept going to Vic. I don't know why. Oh, no. <laughs> what was, what is your question then? So the question is because I'm working on my credit. And I wanted to know with me working on my credit and getting my debt taken care of, does that affect my business credit as well? Because with me having to use my social security number, and even though I do have an like EIN for those businesses mm -hmm. and trying to get funding, does that affect that with my personal as well? That's a really I, great I question. That's a great question. I believe it does because you are your collateral. Your business is your collateral for any loan or account that you're going to take out. So it's still your name on it. Um, that's going to be one of the questions we go over and I could get that question answered for you. If you give me your contact and I can email you the answer before then. Um, Cause that, so like that was one of the questions, how does your personal finance affect your business account? That's, mm -hmm. that's ultimately what you're asking, right? This yeah. is my, is my credit, you know? Yeah. Let me get that answered for you. So are you able to put in the chat, your email address or phone number? Yes. And if you want, Caitlin, we can, because we have their, we collected their email as part okay. of the information. So I can send you all of their emails. And if you. Oh, you know what? I have access to it on. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to do that, that would be great. And then um, I can just email this, these if, yeah. small business questions out to everyone. Would that work? Okay. Yes. So, and if you need help with um, like building your credit, let me know. Cause I can absolutely give you some ideas that help in the long run, just your personal credit. But if you're working on your debt, that's the best way to go. I will say for anybody that's working on debt management, getting out of debt, raising your credit, remember this, pay your bills on time. Every time that is the biggest thing that you could do for your credit, pay your bills on time. Every time, because if you have a late payment that goes on your credit, and people will, that are giving you loans or services will look at your credit and often look how many late payments have you had in the past two years. So it will highly affect you down the line if a creditor, like a loan person is saying, well, you've been late, you know, six out of 12 months, you're high risk at that point. So if anything, electricity, gas, credit card bill, every bill that you have on time, every time make that your personal mantra <laughs> on time, every time. But there are a lot of other ideas that I have, um, for raising your credit pretty easily if you're looking to do that. So, um, personal credit. I'm going to write down this question really quick. Okay. And I need the other question that was earlier that I was going to follow up. What was that? I think it might have been my question about ethical investing. The ethical, yep. Oh, was there another small business one though? If not, that's okay. Okay, one more question. So if you're in the process of trying to start a business but haven't sold anything yet or made a profit or don't have your business registered, but go to try and open an account, will you still be able to open one? No, you'll need your 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 registration number. So until you start, until it's registered as an account, you'll just have to open up a personal account for that. And, and actually Stephanie would go into that if you wanted to talk to her about when is a good time. That was, that's one of her presentation points is when is it a good time to open up your business account? Um, Cause a lot of people want to get on their feet with that before they take payments or sell things. Um, so it's not necessarily a good time to open up a business account because you need to make sure funds are going in there. So you're not paying extra funds. So 
I know it's something I should ask during class, but it kind of relates to opening up an account. Yeah. I would, I, I've heard Stephanie say it's not a good time to open up an account if you don't have your, your registration number, your ID. Great question. Anybody else have any questions? This is great. Feel free to flood me with emails because I will figure out the answer. If I can't answer it, I will answer it for you. I will always come back to that, but I'll get these questions answered for everyone and, and shoot off an email. So um, before you all go, I just want to say uh, thank you again for logging on. We do have your, um, your mailing addresses because we're going to send you something um, for being a part of this event. So um, we'll just follow up with you, I guess, before we send in to make sure it's still the same address, but you should be receiving that um, next week. We'll mail it out next week. Perfect. All right. Well, I hope to see you all back for next month. I think we have one, I think every weekend, don't we? Yeah. It's a pretty long series. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have yeah. a lot of information. We're not going to do it all in one shot. So definitely if you're doing the small business entrepreneur, kind of want to learn, just, you've got a good idea. Where do I go from here? Like hop on those. Um, cause they're, they'll be good. So yeah, but any investing questions, feel free to feel free to contact me. Oh, I know what the other one was. The, the person who worked at Nelnet, if you are, I'm going to, I'll put that in this email too, just in case you didn't catch the, the contact for Jason Hemingway to, to get a hold of your your uh, retirement plan. Yes, because I took a screenshot of, of that information. Okay. I'll put it, I'll, I'll just make sure that it's in that, um, okay. that email. Sorry, I'm writing all these notes down. So, okay. Well, that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time. And I'll, I'll send this um, video to you, Maisha, so you can mm -hmm. send it out. It'll be on, UBT has a, a YouTube page that you can, come back to it. We won't put this on our website, but it is on our, our uh, YouTube page. If you want to come back and, and watch it, um, I'll send you the link too. So you can pass it around. All righty. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you so yes. much everyone for engaging. I really Have appreciate a good day. it. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye.